Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to connect with us today. My name is Jared Hackbert. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at Brilliance Business Solutions. And with me today, I have Lori McDonald and our guest, Drew Douglas. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hello. Uh, so a little bit about me. I started Brilliance a little more than 20 years ago. I went to Purdue in computer electrical engineering and through an internship, ended up at NASA Johnson Space Center, where I eventually worked as a flight controller for the space shuttle program. I ended up meeting my husband at NASA. Uh, he also was an engineer at, who worked as a flight controller at NASA, and he eventually worked for Rockwell Automation. And we ended up relocating to Milwaukee, Wisconsin through a job promotion that he had. And uh, so I ended up in Milwaukee in 1998 and was trying to figure out what could be as cool as space. And so with my technical background and um, in 1998, the web was kind of in its infancy. So I decided to start a web development company. And uh, so over the years we've grown, we have developed uh, a niche in working in the e-commerce space. And specifically, as we'll talk a little bit more on the webinar, um, several years back, we decided to partner with EpiServer as a platform. Um, my husband left his job at Rockwell about nine years ago, and now he leads our development team. And uh, we're really excited to be here today talking about EpiServer tips and trips, <laughs> tips and tricks. And I'm gonna I'm pass it over to Drew, Drew Douglas. I'm so excited to have Drew with us on our call. Drew's a, our lead developer at Brilliance and an expert at all things EpiServer. And Drew, I'd love for uh, you to share a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, um, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I've been a developer at Brilliance for seven years now, and in that time, um, I've been using EpiServer for a little over five years. Um, I think it's a great platform. We were Lori actually introduced it to our team, and um, uh, I just uh, fell in love with um, the uh, architecture, the technical organization, and um, the way it really manages content really well. Um, so yeah, I've been excited to work on it over the last five years. Um, I've been excited to work on our, uh, our core platform, um, which we use to uh, launch EpiServer sites really quickly. Um, and so yeah, I'm great to. I'm excited to be talking about how to troubleshoot it today. Uh, we are really excited to be talking about EpiServer tips and tricks with you today. Uh, as it's been hit on a little bit here, we are uh, huge fans of the platform. We've been partners with, with EpiServer now since 2014 uh, and uh, excited to have our, our lead de developer on the call with us today. So, Drew, <clears throat> for those who are not familiar with EpiServer, or let's start with Lori, for those who are not familiar with EpiServer, let's start with a, a quick description of the solution and why Epi has been a flagship for Brilliance. Yeah, so we uh, we decided to start to partner with EpiServer because we were searching for a platform. Uh, we saw a need in the market specifically around leveraging content and commerce together. So as I mentioned, we uh, specialize in e-commerce solutions. We do a lot of work in the B2B space specifically. Uh, and what we know is that uh, organizations typically need both commerce and content solutions. So they'll have content that they want to share on their website, but they also have some really complex commerce needs. And what we were seeing is a lot of organizations that ended up having to maintain those in two different platforms that could be that could be messy and expensive to maintain. And so we really fell in love with EpiServer's strong um, technical architecture, the fact that they have both platforms in a single framework um, and it's low total cost of ownership that, you know, upgrades, which in, on some platforms can be really time intensive and costly on EpiServer can be really fast um, when everything is architected well. Uh, so we just really fell in love with it as a platform that could enable customers to create a strong foundation that they could build on over time. Uh, and Drew, I, you probably have other thoughts from a technical perspective as to why EpiServer is great. But. <laughs> Yeah, it has. Um, so, I, I mean, it was one of the first uh, platforms that I worked with that had a great DI container set up. Um, so that's where you can really organize um, all the, the code into um, uh, maintainable units and you can plug in other units in, in places. Um, they've got a great pluggable framework uh, for modifying the platform, um, the parts of the architecture that um, you want to customize yourself. 
Um, so from a developer's perspective, it's just really a joy to work with. And then, you know, working with the DXP and um, all the tools that they've given us to deploy to Azure quickly, um, to have insight into um, what's going on in the Azure platform, in our uh, software there, um, the scalability that, that the DXP provides, uh, that's been really great too. So um, it's just, yeah, it's a really uh, sound technical foundation to build a great content website on that you can sell stuff on. So, Drew, for non-developers, what are some ways people can troubleshoot issues that you might be having before you need to get a developer involved? Yeah, so um, when I think about people who um, aren't developers who are working on this site, I typically think about them participating in two parts. One is the, the content development, so, um, you know, editing images and um, text and things like that. And then the other one is, uh, you know, testing, um, getting features ready for go live when you're um, sort of collaborating with a developer on that part. And so um, for uh, content, troubleshooting content, content version and history, um, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. You can schedule pages for future uh, publishing, and that's a really great feature. Um, but one of the things that it adds a little bit of complexity to what you're looking at. So um, one of my favorite tools is this versions gadget that you can add to your um, widgets on the editing screen. And that shows you the current content version that's published, that little target. Um, and then it shows you sort of some dates of the and who edited uh, previous versions. And it's great because you can um, switch to old versions. You can um, compare. You can look through the version history. And then um, you can also use the version compare tool to compare the content from um, two versions that uh, you're working on now and one in the past. So if you're really trying to figure out where your content is, um, what content needs to be updated, or you're editing other people's content, um, these are great tools. Um, and then if you're um, uh, working with developers, um, a lot of times um, what you're doing is working on um, evaluating styles, evaluating design, evaluating front-end JavaScript code. And one thing I always um, remind, try and remind people is if you're not seeing what you expect to be seeing, um, just go ahead and um, do a hard refresh on uh, your browser. So the browser obviously it caches images, it caches JavaScript code, um, CSS styles, all that stuff so that um, uh, it loads pages really quickly and doesn't need to reload the things that you've already downloaded. Um, but when you're in a development setup, um, sometimes the files that are cached in your browser can get stale. So there's a couple ways to do that on most browsers, either through the debugging tools or um, just by issuing a hard reload command. Yeah, that's such a great reminder. There are so many times that I know um, I'm looking at something and think, well, I thought they said it was fixed, but then I just have to remember to do <laughs> a ship refresh. So So I'm curious, Drew, are, do you have recommendations for how business users can troubleshoot uh, external data or external systems as they interface to Appy? Yeah, so this is something where you um, obviously should be working closely with your developers because your developers are going to be doing um, a lot of the work to uh, bring in external data or push data from Epis server into your external system, say for placing an order or getting data from like a, an external CRM. And um, what developers are doing generally is um, they have uh, generally two methods for getting and um, uh, putting data in external systems. Um, one is a scheduled job. And so this would be if um, maybe on a periodic schedule, um, you're pulling down data from an external system or um, on a periodic schedule, you're taking the new orders and pushing them out to an, um, an external system like an ERP. And um, to review uh, what's going on with those scheduled jobs, um, there's a um, uh, an interface in the admin for Epis Server that shows you the history of all the, the scheduled jobs. Um, and there's actually an add-on that does even more. Um, uh, so if you don't, if uh, this doesn't give you enough information, there's an add-on that can show you all your scheduled jobs at once. But this also give you log messages, tell you whether or not jobs succeeded or failed, um, tell you how long they took. So if there's something that's running too long and um, uh, is causing a problem, so you're not getting uh, uh, the most recent data quickly, um, you can take a look in this um, in this section. Um, and then uh, if there's just if jobs are just failing, um, there's a lot of times where um, that problem will either be a credential issue or a problem with um, the URL um, for the external system. 
And um, if you're getting to this point, then um, really your, your developers should be leaving you documentation about um, what external systems you're interfacing with, um, how to update these administrative settings, where to find these settings. And if these settings are actually not in the administrative section, um, but actually in code, um, then they should be leaving you instructions about um, how a, a future developer who works on the system could update those settings, or else what external service provider you should contact. For example, if you need to contact Salesforce to have them um, update like an API key or something. So um, these are just a couple places, but if you're not getting, uh, if you don't know where these things are, definitely ask the developer you're working with on these external systems. They should provide documentation and point these all out to you. What can editors do to troubleshoot if the, if the editor's unable to access or edit content? Yeah, so Epi comes with a great um, uh, permission system that allows you really fine-grained control over who has access to what. Um, so each user can be assigned to these roles, and if they're a member of a role, then they may have access to something, uh, some content on the site. Um, and so if you're an editor and you're trying to edit something, uh, make sure you first belong to the right role to do that. Um, and then secondly, if uh, you have content that you want to access that you don't have access to, um, you can look in the administrative settings for uh, the access settings for um, the content in your EpiServer page tree. And that'll show you um, what, who has, what roles have access to that content to read, create, or update that content. Um, so if, again, if you have questions about this, um, it's something to ask your developer about. Um, but Epi really does provide you a lot of fine grain um, uh, uh, control over who has access to what. Project planning is something that we take very seriously at Brilliance. Uh, we dedicate a lot of time and resources to making sure that we're starting projects off on the right foot. And I'm sure that's the same for many or other agencies as well. Um, for for non-developers, Drew, that are involved in that process and working with the development team, what can they do to support the, uh, the development team best during that step? Yeah, definitely. So your uh, your development team, um, you want to be working very closely with them. Um, just you know, being uh, using great communication skills. Um, uh, sometimes developers need a little encouragement to come out of their shells, but um, they should be you know communicating with you about what your requirements for the system are, what your business requirements are, and um, then um, they should be working on those. And if you're uh, working on testing what your developers are doing, um, obviously a big part of that is going to be um, doing bug reports. So um, for for helping developers understand what issues you have, generally the five W's um, are, are great for um, framing out the parts of a, um, a bug report. Developers really appreciate that that um, detailed information of who is submitting the report um, and what user are you trying to um, be when you're trying to do something on the site, say you're being an anonymous user trying to check out or you're trying to log in and update your contact information. Um, what's the context? What's the motivation? Again, what are you what are you trying to do um, when you experience this bug? Um, and when was the when did the um, unexpected behavior happen? Um, a lot of times, a very um, specific um, timestamp of when you're trying to do something will be really helpful because um, the site will generate error messages, and each one of those will have a timestamp on it saying exactly when that error happened, and um, we can correlate your actions with what is going on in the log. Um, and then, you know, where is the user attempting to do the work, um, what pages, and really for figuring that out, um, screenshots are, are great. Um, the um, uh, video is really the gold standard um, for this, but uh, every Windows, if you're using Windows, um, uh, has a screenshot tool. If you just press Win Shift S, um, that'll give you a, uh, a screenshot of what you're looking at. You can draw a couple annotations on it and point exactly where the problem is, um, and that really is really helpful for developers. But like I said, um, if you can take a video, that's absolutely the gold standard because that shows us exactly what you were trying to do and then exactly how the, the site behaved. And um, there's some tools that you can uh, also get. Um, some of them are free, but the video ones generally you have to pay for. Um, or you can use something like uh, go to meeting or MS Teams. You can have a meeting with yourself and take that video. Um, that's just really helpful for those real pernicious bugs where it's hard to describe what's going on. Um, and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, 
um, that sounds like a lot of effort to put into to put into a bug report. And uh, you know, you just want to keep the lines of communication open with your developers. Make sure that they understand um, what's going on and um, uh, giving them the, as much information as possible. Yeah, I think they're such great tips. Uh, I mean, I, uh, so much, uh, it's so important to be able to reproduce an issue. And so the screenshots and videos make it so much easier to understand what's actually happening. And may, because maybe sometimes a user will describe something in a way um, that isn't a full representation of what's happening. And so uh, it's, it's great to remember to have screenshots and video as a part of it. Yeah, I need to do that myself too, just because you know you're working on a problem. Even as a developer, you have your assumptions about um, what the system should do and how you think it should behave. And sometimes I don't even myself communicate clearly what my expectations were. And so having these screenshots really makes it crystal clear. What are some tools for debugging an F server? Yeah, so one of my favorite tools is the um, developer add-on. This is developed by um, an outside epi dev, or up, I mean, uh, 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 a leading epi dev. He doesn't work for billions. He works for um, another company. Um, his name is uh, Valdis, and I can't I can't pronounce his last name, but you can follow him at uh, Tech Fellow on Twitter. Um, but this is a great add-on, and it provides developers a lot of insight into uh, what's happening in EpiServer. Um, you can look at content types, you can look at logs, you can look at um, the performance when the system starts up. So if you're having slow startup issues, um, you can uh, view some of the indices in the cache and clear the cache. It's um, really a great tool for gaining insight into the um, what's going on in the inner workings of Epi. Um, and then, like I mentioned, uh, log messages are really one of the core tools. EpiServer um, has a real uh, fine-grained tool for um, getting exactly the log messages out that you want at the, the right um, sort of chattiness. Um, and uh, it provides a lot of information when something goes wrong about what the computer was doing right before that error occurred. Um, and it helps us trace back to um, the code that we wrote and then how we're using the libraries. And if we're using something incorrectly or maybe there's an underlying problem in a database or a connection, it really helps us um, figure that out quickly. Drew, how would you recommend investigating site speed uh, issues or like page load time in EpiServer? Yeah, so those are some tools um, for some. There are some performance things that are on the in the developer um, uh, the developer add-on. Um, one of my favorite tools is kind of an oldie but goodie um, that's not an EpiServer tool. is called Mini Profiler. Um, I've used this on a couple sites. It was actually originally developed for a site called Stack Overflow, which is a, a programmer um, discussion and help site um, that's very popular. And uh, this gives you a great interface um, for seeing exactly what's happening um, in every single call to a website. So um, you can see the total time it took to make this call and get all the data, all the uh, information on the page back. Um, and then uh, you can instrument up your code. And um, if you're uh, clever, um, there's some tricks you can do with the dependency in, uh, injection system to really label all the service calls get, that get made in the course of loading a single page. And you can really drill into what the most expensive parts of uh, that call are in time. So for site speed, this is really figuring out how long did it take to load the first byte of the page? What is going on in the server to compute uh, what it needs to show the user? Um, and then there are some other great tools um, just that are available in browsers for um, figuring out the, the rest of the picture. So if you're having slow image load times or um, your JavaScript performance is lagging, um, both Chrome and Firefox um, provide great debugging tools for um, digging into the timings of um, that client side code and then what's going on over the network. Yeah, and I know there have been instances where we uh, co are collaborating with EpiService DXP team to um, work, you know, issues jointly with them as they're, you know, ensuring that the on their side things are set up the way they need to be for this site. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, just to mention, yeah, that you mentioned uh, the DXP. The DXP has great performance um, evaluation tools through the um, Azure portal. Um, so you need to sign up, uh, you need to request access from uh, EpiServer to get there. And then uh, if you're having performance issues and you really want to see what's going on, EpiServer can turn on um, profiling for the Azure tools, and that'll show you sort of the exact same trace information that you're looking at here through Mini Profiler. Um, but it'll capture that at the exact right time when the performance is slow. So it's a great tool to have too. Uh, Drew, as a, as a developer out there who knows .NET development but is new to Epic Server, what would you say is their best path to getting up to speed? Yeah, so for me personally, I was fortunate enough to be able to take an in-person course um, a few years back um, from an Epi, um, an Epi trainer, actually two, two, uh, one for CMS and one for commerce. Um, and that was a great way to um, launch my understanding. Um, Episerver World has uh, really good documentation and then just a ton of blog posts and forum posts. Um, so if you're really looking to dig into the features, the documentation is great. Um, but you know, for me, not everything really clicked until I started working on Episerver projects. So um, if you've got that resource available that's an experienced Episerver developer um, to work on a project with, um, that is so helpful. Um, uh, save that. Um, there are some great example projects out there that Episerver has published. Um, for example, the foundation website. Um, you can look at all the source code for a complete implementation. Um, and if you want to, you can even use that as a starter site. Um, the foundation code is great, but um, it also includes a lot of features that you may not use. And so um, sometimes you might spend a, a lot of time taking out features that um, uh, just aren't aren't a part of the solution that you're looking for. Um, so that may be a reason why you wouldn't want to start with it, but it's a great resource for digging into an example use of um, all the EpiServer framework. Yeah, and I would add in, so uh, Drew, you, you noted how it can be really helpful to like work with other developers as a part of getting up to speed. I think that's so true. And certainly uh, I know that, you know, for developers on our team, they'll only want to go to so much training before they actually want to get their hands on some code. <laughs> and that seems to be true for our clients too, as they're learning uh, EpiServer. And in many instances, we ended we end up co-developing with new developers on client teams and that gives them an opportunity to uh, work and collaborate with an EpiServer developer that's more experienced than, than they are, um, which I think can be a great, as, as you said, Drew, just a great avenue for learning. And so um, that's something that we're happy to, to provide to clients through our, our EpiServer success plans. Um, and Drew, you mentioned earlier that we have a framework that we developed for starting development on EpiServer. Um, called Catalyst, and um, so um, you know, so versus versus Foundation, um, you know, it's it's our uh, path for starting up a server development projects, and it's cleaner, doesn't have as much in it as Foundation, and, and makes it I think easier for developers to collaborate with us when they're newer to the platform. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite parts is, is collaborating with uh, other developers and you know helping new people. Um, find their way through EpiServer. It's, uh, it's a really rewarding experience. Definitely. Yeah, and you, you, you had mentioned training. Laurie, I, I know there's some, I think some free training out there right now through yeah, EpiServer. Right, uh, so EpiServer right now through their Comeback Stronger offer, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> uh, EpiServer through their Comeback Stronger offer is, is providing free online training, free training to their online courses that's available. Um, so if you go to EpiServer's website to Comeback Stronger, you can find access to that. Definitely take advantage of that. EpiServer is, is certainly a robust platform with a lot of functionality. Do you believe there are any pieces of EpiServer that go underutilized? Yeah, I'll, I'll start uh, if that's okay. Um, so, um, you know, I think one, one of the things that's interesting with EpiServer is that one of the features I first fell in love with that I think many customers I talk to are excited about is EpiServer's personalization capabilities. And visitor groups was one of the first ways that I became aware of EpiServer's uh, personalization capabilities several years back. Uh, now they have some much more sophisticated personalization tools, but on the whole, those personalization capabilities I find 
are, while often the reasons customers are excited about EpiServer, customers are often slow to actually implement. And I think that's for a few reasons. One can be that planning out how you're going to use those visitor groups can be tricky in terms of thinking about what are the groups that you want to have and what do you want to show them which is why I think EpiServer's recent acquisitions that enable personalization using machine learning are really powerful and have some great opportunities because they really simplify th that work um, and leverage machine learning in a way that, that makes the recommendations and figures out that strategy um, in, in part for you or at least gives you the tools to do it. And so one thing uh, that we have up here on the screen, EpiServer's new, new um, content recommendations that through the acquisition that they made of IDEO. Um, now EpiServer is offering a free access to their content diagnostics tool, which is not the full version of IDEO and the content recommendations, but enables you to, to um, leverage um, the machine learning to, to basically take a catalog and inventory of all the content on your site and make recommendations of what content opportunities exist for you and what content's getting the most views um, and just really give you some great information that your team can be using to better strategize around how you're leveraging content on your site. And then if you have the full version, you can actually be making real-time content recommendations to users on your site for what content might interest them the most. So uh, I think some really powerful tools that are there. Drew, what do you think? Um, yeah, I definitely love the AI personalization tools and it definitely gets, uh, removes a lot of the work of doing visitor groups, although, you know, understanding your segments and it really allows you to understand your segments um, better. Um, one of my, as a developer, one of the features that I love uh, using most and I find isn't used as, as often as it could be is the um, edit attributes in the, the view side. So if editors are coming through, um, obviously, you know, just editing text is um, pretty easy to, to do um, on the page in EpiServer. Um, but if there are other things like, um, for example, there's a, a pop-up on our website that has a countdown clock on it for our webinar series. And um, you can actually uh, create an editor tool that allows you to click on that clock and set the date and time that that um, clock is scheduled to um, complete um, using pretty simple, straightforward editor tools from, from EpiServer. Um, so I would definitely recommend, um, if you're not making use of them, um, use the editor attributes and editor hints um, when you're designing pages for editors, it just makes their job so much easier. Definitely, and uh, I appreciate that because uh, it makes it so that we're, we're we're less likely to make a mistake when we're editing things, and it enables greater control over the way everything looks. Um, so th those are great uh, things to be using. So Drew, I know you have uh, a passion for education and supporting people in, in their learning. Uh, do you have anything specifically you'd like to hit around working with developers? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like I said, developers, um, you know, developers oftentimes see the code that they're working on as their baby. Um, so, um, uh, sometimes they can be just a little um, sensitive about the work that they're doing. And um, I always like to think that, um, you know, you can be, you know, very firm with developers, um, but you should be just a little bit gentle just because they're um, working on stuff that's very personal to them, as is everyone in this space. You know, everyone is working on um, uh, giving the customer the best experience and um, doing things in a timely manner. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, if you're not getting the communication that you want to from your developer, um, I, I would just recommend, um, you know, asking them or, or if they're or if they're um, explaining things and um, it's not really making sense to you, definitely go back and ask for a simpler explanation. One of the things that developers should be able to do is um, communicate complex technical ideas to you, the editor, um, in a simple and straightforward manner. And if they're not doing that, just go back and ask for a simpler explanation. And if they can't do that, then that might be um, a sign of a, a communication problem um, early on. Um, so just something to be aware of. Um, but uh, you know, we as developers, we love working with users. We love helping users um, uh, have great magical experiences with uh, EpiServer and all the software we work on. So, um, you know, just developers are out there trying to do their best to uh, bring you the features that you need for, for your website. 
Yeah, I love that. I think it's such a great uh, recommendation to remember. And you know, we think about um, creating great technical products, and a lot of it comes down to good communication too. Like a good um, being really knowledgeable in terms of programming is really important, and the technical understanding is important. But communication is so important in that as well. So, those yeah. those are great tips, Drew. Thank you, Drew, for taking the time Thanks, to man. sit down with us and do this today. Thank you and have a great day.